I came across the story of a young grand boy, Niam Wei, getting shot and killed in Utica, New York, one morning. It caught my eye because it was about a Quran refugee. I have a connection with Myanmar and the Quran people because I have spent some time there during my career as a photojournalist. I traveled to upstate New York. This was the day before the funeral. There were a few dozens of Quran people from the community gathered in the backyard of Niam Wei's family home. I thought I was back in a village in Myanmar. Shiva, mother of the boy who was shot and killed, was sitting on one of those straw mats. She could not stop crying, and her eyes were so swollen. She was surrounded by some women who were comforting her. It's a Myanmar tradition to keep the grieving family company and not to leave the house empty for a while. A few blocks down the street, there's this memorial for Niam Wei. This was where he was chased down and shot. Several candles filled the sidewalk and there was a little note that said, Justice for Nyam Wei. I thought about how this incident affected the small community here. Back at the home, you can see it's not a very large space. Nyam Wei's family actually occupy only part of this shared house. This is their main living area and off to the side is the Buddhist shrine used for prayers. The room is now filled with pictures of Nyam Wei that the community made for protest marches since the shooting. Shiva prays here in the morning. This is the closet that Nyam Wei often slept in when he wanted to be alone. It's being used for storage now, but it used to be his getaway for some solitude in his small home. The next morning, we headed to the funeral home for the memorial service. Close to a thousand people showed up to pay their respects. Nyam Wei's casket was carried by his brothers, cousins, and friend. The weather was really nice that day. Bright blue skies and beautiful clouds, but the air was completely different. It was heavy and somber. This is one of Nyam Wei's cousins on the left, Matt Kapo So. He was so expressive in his emotions. I felt as though the chaotic compositions of the clouds in the background sort of reflected how they must have felt as they buried him that day. Just a row of emotions. The next time I saw the family is a couple of weeks later. I returned to Utica with my colleagues in August. A couple of weeks after what would have been Nyam Wei's 14th birthday. The Quran community were gathering once more, this time for an annual wrist tying festival. Everyone was adorned in vibrant and colorful traditional wear. They were tying threads. Given the nature of the festival, it was a joyful event. I was able to capture this rare moment of Shiva laughing with her daughter. She was trying to feed her some triangular-shaped lumps of sticky rice, which apparently Pokowo doesn't like at all. She tried to run away from her mother in an attempt to avoid being fed. It was a brief moment of reprieve when I caught a glimpse of pure joy from Chiva. The family headed home once the festival ended, but then decided to go visit the cemetery. The family had not visited the cemetery since the funeral. Unlike the beautiful day of the funeral in July, the weather was gloomy and cold with rain. I captured this intimate moment of the family on that day. I arrived in the morning alone the next day. I spent some time with Shiva when I arrived. We tried to communicate through sign language due to the language barrier. She eventually called her eldest son to help translate. Tung Wu asked if I wanted to accompany him on his visit to the cemetery. And we drove to the cemetery together. Similar to the day before, the weather was pouring with rain. I had to go back to the car to grab an umbrella while Tung Wu headed towards his brother's grave. When I finally caught up, I found him squatting in front of the grave. He just stared at it and mumbled something that I suppose only the ghost of his brother could hear. 
I later asked him if he was praying and he said he was telling his brother how much he missed him. After the cemetery, Tong Oh offered to show me around some of their favorite spots to hang out and we went to the basketball court where they would often play ball. He sat on the bleachers for some time and looked out. He then walked me over to a nearby stream where they would always stop by before heading home. After playing all day and walking up a sweat, they'd jump into the stream for a quick swim to cool off. This kind of stuff is very common in Myanmar. When we returned home, he pulled up this YouTube channel called SML and explained that he and his brother would often watch this together. Even as he showed me these videos, he couldn't help but throw back his head and laugh. His sister, who was just chilling on the bed behind him, got curious. She sat on his lap and the two watched the videos together for a while. Eventually, it was time for me to leave. Tong Wu turned off the TV and walked me to the door. There wasn't a trace of a laughter in his face anymore. As I left the home, I thought about the family I was leaving behind me and the boy who would forever be 13 years old. He was Nyam Wei. He had a mother and a father. He had brothers, a sister and cousins. He also had a whole life ahead of him. In one night, all that changed. Uh, the reason why we're stopping, keep your hands out of your pockets. Uh, the reason why we're stopping is you're riding the roadway and you're oh, walking. And you're walking. Oh, shit, I forgot about that. You mean you forgot about that? Like, he was just having oh, a yeah. like, he was living right with yeah. Can I just pat you down and make sure you got no weapons on you? Here you go. 